There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. We'll start um, with the third session in introduction to programming. And we've been going really, really fast up until now, so we're going to take a little bit slower, and the only thing we're going to see today is functions. However, functions are not that easy, as you might, um, uh, we'll see in the no next couple of slides. But before we do that, we're going to look first at uh, the typical examples that I stopped with last time, because I think those are extremely important. Not only important to know, because this is like a basic skill of programming that should be exercised and exercised again, and that's why we had exercises up until now about this on our server. But that's also why we're going to have tomorrow an in-class exercise where he gets, just like on the exam, a piece of paper in front of you and where you have to program on paper. The type of programming, programming task is like one of these here. Um, not the three or four paper type of um, uh, exercises, but uh, more or less like this one over here. And in order to do that, I'm going to just do one quickly in the class as well, because I think that is a good thing to exercise and to um, remember. Let's see where we are. Let's just make ourselves a directory. Um, let's call it test. Let's go in the directory. And let's create a CPP program called test as well. Let's just maximize this over here. Right, so basically the, what you typically will get at the exercises as well as the exam is the things you don't really have to know by heart. For instance, the fact that you have to include um, IO stream if you want to um, put something out on the terminal. Uh, right, so that is something you normally get. You, I mean, this is something you can Google for as well. The things I expect you to know, but that also typically are given are the fact that you um, have to have a main function and that this main function is returning something. Uh, that's, that is the, the key start of our, 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 our every program exercise. You need to build a program. Well, this is a program right now. We could already compile this, and hopefully it doesn't give any errors. Now let's go and uh, oops, do also what I uh, told you in the beginning. Always start with a header where you basically say who you are and then a description of what you want to do. In the exercises, you also have pro to provide your student ideas so that we can kind of test for this. But we're now going to, for instance, um, most, many of the exercises were counting downwards, so we're going to count up from a number, let's say 12, to a higher number, let's say 120. Um, and write this number in the terminal, terminal, um, and then add a little bit of, of, of things there because that is fairly easy. Um, do this in steps of three, for instance. We can already start. This is a, should be a fairly simple loop for you, right? This is something that I think every one of you will be able to do already. First things first, um, what type of loop shall we use here? We saw three types of loops. There's the while loop, the do while loop, and the for loop. Which ones would make sense here? The for, the for loop, but then you already have to know exactly how many times you're going to print out a character on the terminal. Uh, you could do this. You do, do 120 minus 12 divided by three. But that is a lot of work, right? The while loop would be uh, the start operation. Mm -hmm. So you could say while loop, uh, the starting number is smaller uh, or the same as every time. Exactly. So uh, as you said, we basically we could use while, and then there we don't have to predict anything anymore, right? We don't have to calculate these things anymore. An alternative would be the do while, because we know, OK, or if, if you think a little bit ahead, we start with 12, then we add 3, but 12 already needs to be um, uh, printed on the terminal. So also there, the do while loop would probably also be a pretty good choice, right? Because we already execute at least one time what is um, being defined in the, in the block of the loop, right? So, I, I, okay, I'm going to not follow any of your advice now, um, but I'm going to go for the do while loop. But it's, in essence, exactly what you said. So basically, we start with a number. 
Uh, let's put it over here. An integer would be the right type of number. I hope you see this. We could do a double as well, of course, or a float. We could even do a character and print out the, the number that is uh, represented as a character. So all of those would be, in this case, actually valid types that you could use. But I think an integer is kind of the easier uh, solution. So we say we need to uh, have a number. We can immediately initialize this to 12, right? So this is the number to iterate over. Um, that we're going to use in our assignment. So basically, we're going to immediately output this number to the terminal. We've seen how that is used. So we say the standard output should display our number. And then after that, I mean, if we, so we could also write this, do this in steps of three and print a number on each line. So that each number has basically on, is on one line so that we basically also have the, is it end line? Yeah, end line, exactly. So this is printing out number, right? That is fairly simple. The only thing that we need to do is say, when do we stop? When do we stop? I mean, basically, we count from 12 to 120, so we should stop when number is bigger than 120, I would say, right? So number is bigger than 120 is our stopping condition. As soon as that is happening, we continue over here to line 17 to line 18 and we exit our program. Right, so that is already outputting everything. The thing is, if I would run this, what would happen? I would get the number 12 for infinity, right? Because this loop is not advancing. That's why in every loop you need a variable that makes sure that it that is incremented or decremented or changed in some way so that eventually the number will be bigger than 120, right? And there we have again our description over here. We need to do this in steps of three. Up until now, we've seen most loops uh, have this I++, or in this case, the number++, plus plus, but we need to add three. Yes, a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, we are counting up from 12 to 120. Mm -hmm. count up from 20 to O. Oh, um, while the number is bigger than 120, it does not make sense. Exactly. Thank you very much. So the number should be, while the number is smaller than 120, and if you want 120 as well, then it's also equal to 120, right? Since we're doing this in steps of three, we will actually land exactly on 120. So very good point. Thank you. Right, so that is that, um, and we need to do this in steps of three. How do we do that? There's hundreds of ways of doing this. So one nice to read way is saying number equals number plus three. So we assign to the variable number the value that number has and add three to that, and that value we assign back to number. And that is what's basically happening there. That's one of the operators we saw last time. There's a shorter way of doing that, Exactly, plus equal, that is exactly the same, but a lot shorter, or, well, a few characters shorter, right? And if you know this, then, uh, then you can deal with this. The number plus equals three means that if the number had 12 now, sudden, then in the next step, the number will have 15, right? 12 plus three is 15, and that is put into number. Okay, so this will already work, I hope, right? So it will output all numbers from 12 to 120 into the terminal. So let's go to our test directory, and we know if we basically uh, create our program, we do just G++, we can also output this in a specific executable like tests. We don't have errors, right? And then let's see if this is working. So we execute our program, et voila, there we have it, right? So. This is not a very hard task. We start at 12 and we end at 120. Everything is fine. Now to make, this would be a one pepper example, for instance, I would say. This is fairly simple. Now we could make this a little bit harder and say um, each time the number is uh, multiplied, 
multiple of five print out five instead that means what do we need to do now we need to do checking if we need to print out a number or if we have to print out five to the terminal right that means we need to go in two di different directions and we've seen if that is the case then an if or else statement is probably the best way to do this so we have an if statement um, and then followed by an else statement because we have to do something in the other case as well um, that's already prepared for that so basically if we have a normal number let's do it that way then we print out the number like before however if we have a multiple of um, five then we print out five printing out five is something we haven't seen that often yet but basically it's just printing out a string right this is something that is, is, is fairly simple the only thing we need to do now is create this test how do we know that our number is a multiple of five also that we, we saw already at least three times by now yeah exactly so modulo is the operator we've seen that you probably didn't have that much experience with so therefore I say this again and again learn to operate with modulo it's basically the remainder after division that means if you have your number and you divide it by five then if it's a multiple of five then the remainder of that will be zero that means if we do the modulo of five and we say this is zero then and now we know this is a multiple of five so it will be true that what, which is between the braces here if it is a multiple of five now one important aspect is here priority something we've seen also last time this is an operator this is an operator and how do we know which one has priority maybe um, it says five equals zero no that is false so in that case we have number modulo false and that is probably giving an error right in this case you might know that this has priority but I explicitly told you don't worry about priority just use braces wherever you can so everyone is reading that is reading your source code here is looking at first we have to calculate number modulo 5 it's basically the remainder after you divide number by 5 and then you test whether this is 0 right and this will be true if the number is a multiple of 5 it will be false if the number is not a multiple of 5 if the number is a multiple of 5 I should actually write 5 not number so I should turn this around I could turn these two lines around so 18 and 16 I could switch again that is a lot of work there is an easier way of doing this exactly so the exclamation mark means here if it's not equal to 0 that means if it's now a multiple of 5 which is not 0 uh, uh, that which is 0 then it will be going to the 5 and if it's uh, if it is a multiple of 5 uh, if it isn't a multiple of 5 then it will print out the number itself right so we just switched around the true and the false condition over here okay also that requires a description here because that is a little bit harder so um, test if number is multiple of five there we go printing out not a number over here always look up, out after print out five there we go so now we have something that also tests the number whenever it is a multiple of five it will print out five otherwise it just prints out that number with a single loop so let's try that we basically compile that works we execute and indeed every time or every couple of uh, numbers so 12 plus 3 is 15 15 is divisible by 5 27 plus 3 is 30 30 is divisible, uh, divisible by 5 and so on or is a multiple by 5 so basically that works right so this is kind of a two pepper example which is very typical of what you will get tomorrow and on the exam but also it's a prototype of a basic program exercise where you have to juggle around loops 
and conditions. And this is like one of the basic constructs of programming that everyone should know. I mean, this is a basic programming thing, right? So this is something you should exercise and exercise and exercise again. Right. Um, let's go back to previous. So I'm cleaning up for the next exercise I'm going to do in a second or the next um, the next programming bits that I am going to do. Right, so now we're going to start. Oh, sorry, a, a question. Is there a question for tomorrow? Yes. Uh, it would be good, but you're not getting points uh, uh, subtracted when you don't write comments. We are looking at mostly ha the same for indentation. Do indent your code. If it really looks very, very ugly, we might actually be so annoyed by it. Um, but, but typically, you should know by now that you should indent your code, that you should format your code according to a nice formal style. Um, and the rest, um, or I think the weight should be really on the correctness of your code. Yeah. Okay, um, but we can uh, answer some more questions about tomorrow uh, later as well, but let's start now with functions finally. So up until now, you've seen things that you could have, uh, or you could use up until now and don't worry about any of this anymore and then you basically can already program in C. However, you'll have to program everything into the main function and you have to go around a couple of corners sometimes. So that everything that follows now is making your life easier and is um, creating a little bit of more insights on how programs tend to work and also where lots of difficulties arise when you are programming. Functions is such a thing. Often people think that functions are easy. You just create and define a function, then it has a little bit of codes that you can use there, and then from now on you have something that you can wrap up uh, into uh, a function and use anywhere you'd like. That is true, but there is a lot more to it. So we've seen already blocks. Blocks of code are the things between the, between the curly braces. Like after the if statements, we typically always start with curly braces. Um, after the main function, we always start with curly braces. And wherever you are in your code, you can define yourself a block with the curly braces. That's what we've seen already. And we've seen that in this curly braces block, if you define a variable there of a particular type, then this variable will be erased after that block is left. That's exactly what is going to happen in functions as well, except that you also have things like it can return something, a variable of your, uh, of your choice, and it can uh, get multiple variables as parameters. That's kind of the idea of a function. And the cool thing about functions is that you can define them once and then use them as many times as you'd like. And this is also the reason or the core reason why people use functions. They basically create a function, uh, make this available somewhere as an extra file, and then people who want to use that function because it's a really cool function that is something nice to use, will, will be able to use that function again and again. So we have here an example of a function where we start out with a very simplistic way. So this is somewhere, for instance, in your main function. We have uh, several variables, the maximum, we initialize that to zero. We have two uh, numbers, an A number, which is 12, and a B number that is 10. Again, those are three integers that are somewhere in your memory. Each of those fills up four bytes of memory, and they have particular values. Now we choose our block here, like this. So we open our curly braces, and up until now, we basically have something that we can kind of compact. as something where we say, this is, uh, this is, a, uh, is a series of statements that belong together. And this series of statements kind of calculate the maximum of uh, the numbers that we're going to create here. So here we have a first statement, which is the if statement. It checks, checks if or tests if A is bigger than B. If that is the case, then we say maximum equals A. If this is not the case, then B is the maximum. So maximum equals B. That means as soon as we leave this block over here, maximum will have the value 12, right? This is possible. If we would have had these uh, variables within the block, then after leaving this block, all those variables would be gone. Right? That, is, that is the thing we've learned last time. Now this is a skeleton of a function already. 
because in this uh, block over here, we kind of defined the, the, the number of statements or a sequence of statements that calculate for us the maximum out of a number, out of two numbers, and return this, right? So this is something that is a function. And if you're programming this, you could use this in your main function again and again and again. If you needed this 20 times, then you would need to repeat this 20 times. Unless you can put this into a loop somehow. But, you know, this is what you have until now. Now, functions allow you to define this, and then later, whenever you're in your main function, you can basically call up this function, and this function will execute these statements again and again and again. So you don't have to write these things out all the time. So that is the core reason why people use a function. So what we will do is we first uh, give the function a name. Well, we call it, for instance, maximum. That would be a very valid name. We could also call it max, or we call it any, t any name we'd like it. And again, here, the naming convention is exactly that of variables. And so you can start um, with uh, a normal letter, capital or not. Uh, you can start with a number, and then basically have a, 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 a mix of the two, with an underscore also as a possible uh, character. Right, so that's the name. Now, each function also delivers something or has the potential to deliver something. In this case, it's an integer. Um, we could also create any other type that we already know. A character, a bool, a float, a double. All of those are possible. So basically, if our function then is returning, then we can also deliver a value to a, a, a variable that we have. And then, that's what we're going to see in a second, and then between the, um, the braces over here, we can have a list of parameters. It can be none, which is what we've used up until now for our main function, right? So if we start our main function, we know that the main function returns an integer. It is called main and then has no parameters whatsoever. This function will have some parameters, namely two. And again, here you can choose whatever type of variable we've seen already. So it doesn't have to be an integer, it could also be a float, a double, it could be a character, or it could be a bool for a boolean. So this here is the definition of a function. That's what you can do at the beginning of your program, where you say, I am going in my program somewhere to define a function and implement it, which is called maximum, has two integers as parameters, and returns an integer. You can do this in one go, and this is how we typically will do this in the next couple of weeks just because it's simpler and easier to write and the program will be shorter, you basically immediately say, this is what I define my new function as, as we had before, and then straight away, with the curly braces, we say what the function implements, what the function does. And here we have exactly the same what we saw on the last slide again, except that we don't define an <coughs> extra variable called maximum and assign an A or B's value to this maximum. Instead, we have this return statement over here. Now this return statement we have already seen 100 times in our main function. Now we're going to use this to return either the value of A or return the value of B. That means if A is bigger than B, then we return the value of A and then our function is done. Then we don't, do, then we don't jump anymore to this line over here and our if else statement is done, no. We basically return straight out of, uh, after here, out of our function. The same if b is bigger than a, then we go in our else class over here and we return the value of b. Now where are those values going is a very important question for you to ask. Because we don't have a variable where we put this in. This is kind of this integer over here, which is nameless. That means whenever we have our function, a value is being returned, and this uh, value is an integer in this case, but we don't know in which variable this is held. Right? That, is, that is kind of what you should hold for now. Everything else is basically just accepting that a function is defined and implemented this way. Right? And again, the nice thing here is once we've defined the function this way, we can call our function, use our function as much as we'd like. We don't have to write these statements again and again. Uh, that is the, the, main uh, the main functionality of a function. Right. Now, functions can be called, and that means that if a function is called, we basically then call up the implementation of our function. 
And a very tricky thing is, and this is also the second thing I want you to really hold uh, in thought right now, is that whenever we can call a function, um, we can also call that function within the function or within other functions. And that makes it quite complex very soon. So you could have a function A, which in its implementation calls the function B. And in the function B, you can also have in the implementation of the function a call to A. That means you have functions where in the implementations they call each other. Later we'll see also that a function can call itself. So you define a function, implement that function, and then somewhere as one of the statements, you call the function itself. All of that is possible. And th that makes it a little bit more abstract or a little bit weirder than you would think if you're um, uh, used to the, to the typical uh, iterative programming paradigm. Right, so here's an example where we first say we define or we're going to uh, implement a function A. Its name is A, it has no parameters, and it returns an integer. We are also doing that with a B function. Exactly the same, except that it's called B. And much or later, we will define those functions. So in this case, we say, or we will implement those functions. In this case, we say, whatever A does is it will uh, output yes to the terminal and then return whatever B is doing. And for B, we say whatever B, well, B is implemented by returning no to the terminal and then returning A. If one of those two functions is then, for instance, called in your main function, then what you will have is an endless loop of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, until your program crashes. Does anyone already know why your program crashes? Eventually? It's an infinite loop. The CPU might be having problems, but I doubt that is the case. No? Sorry? A stack overflow, very good. But what does that mean? Well, that's what we're going to see in the next couple of slides. And that's what I want you to understand as well. Calling functions is not always as cheap as you think. It, rem it means that you have to do something else. It costs something. And what? That we'll see in a second. But what we'll see from this slide is calling a function is basically just writing the function together with the braces. And if you have parameters that you can pass, then those will appear, whoops, then those will appear in those braces over here. Right? That is what calling a function will mean. Okay. Now, parameters uh, are used. We have, again, the same parameters over here. We have a very similar function that we're going to implement over here, except that it's not called maximum. It's called print maximum. I don't want to give the maximum out to some other variable. I want to just print it out. And because of that, I have this special thing called void here. Void means the function doesn't return anything. And as you can see here, if you have something that doesn't return anything, you don't even need a return statement in the implementation of the function. This is called a procedure. So basically, if you call that function, then that function will not return anything. Void. Void means nothing. Right? That's, that's, um, that's what, you, what you already can see by the definition of this function. And in the, in, in the implementation, we see that something very similar is happening. You basically have just a sequence of statements over here, which do something very similar. You know, basically have A and B are our variables. And then we basically um, output either A or B, depending on who is the biggest, and then end this with an end line. And then we don't return anything, because we, don't, we set here in the definition that our function is not returning anything, right? <clears throat> so these parameters are passed when we call the function. That's something we haven't seen yet. In our previous slide, we saw how a function is called, but we don't see yet how this is used over here. Now, this is where we're going to see an example of how, under the hood, calling a function works. And this will give already a hint to what the stack overflow is that uh, the gentleman over there already um, gave us as an answer, as a correct answer to why a function or calling a function is not as cheap as you would think or comes with a certain cost. All right. Here we have a little program that you could immediately uh, put into your terminal or start programming and test it out. It will work. 
But in this case, we declare and implement a function which we call my function. It doesn't do that much sensible. It's just done doing some arithmetic function over here and returns that plus one, right? So it, it, that's, these are operators. Actually, we should use also here braces, uh, uh, but um, for space reasons, I basically made it as short as possible. And in our main function, we basically have two uh, um, integers that we define over here. We could have just used a comma here as well. We have a, a variable x, we have a variable a, and then we put into a the output of our my function, where we use as the two uh, variables, uh, to two parameters of that function, which are just variables, the value of a and the value of x plus one. And that is very important. Whenever we call a function, we pass values of an expression that is here. It could be just a, a variable. In that case, we take the value of a and pass this. Or it could be the value of x plus 1. So we take the value of x, we add 1, and that value we give to the function. So we copy by value, this is called. And it's very important to understand what this means. And to do this, we're going to see this on a, in our memory again. So in our memory, we have our main function. In this case, we're going to see this block by block, right? And we've seen already x gets a little bit of space. These are four bytes over here, and they have the value 10. Our other variable, a, has also some space, also four bytes, or 32 bits, and has the value 12. That's what you saw in this line over here. Right, so that is already part of our main function. And this is a little bit of memory that we need so that we know what values these variables have and that those are variables of a certain type. Now, whenever we are going for a function call over here, like over here, what we're doing is we create a second part in memory somewhere. And the second part belongs to our function my font. And what we're doing there is for the parameters of that function, the parameters of the function are integer b and integer a over here. We're going to already reserve some space for that function. So we have our integer b and we have our integer a. Now, for integer b, we get the value of whatever is here, the expression that is here. The expression that is here is an integer a, which has nothing to do with this uh, a over here. It's just to confuse you but it's also to make sure that you understand that this block over here, this blue block, is basically in its own world. It can't look at this x or this a over here. This is a piece of memory where you only have two variables up until now, which are b and a. And the value of b is, happens to be 12, because 12 was passed over here. The number 12. The value of our int a, uh, um, integer over here is 11 because here we had the value of 10 plus 1 that value is copied into our integer a over here that belongs to this function my font so in this world whenever we're going to execute now things between in the block that belongs to our my font uh, that we basically have these two variables we don't have these variables at all anymore we can't access x and we can't access this A anymore. All we have is whatever is in the blue zone in our memory, okay? And that means that whenever we start, we basically have those two functions. We go to the next line over here, we calculate what A was. So we basically do two times B plus A times A. Uh, this is 145, you can check this, hopefully I did not make a mistake, and then we can go through all the statements of our function until we go uh, to the return line, and this could be anywhere in our function. Whenever we get to return, we return the value of a plus one in this case and leave our function. So we return in this case a plus one, so 146, and this value is basically copied, and it's copied in this case to whatever is written over here. So we have our assignment he here, and whatever our, whenever our function ends, that value that we had over here is assigned to a. That means a becomes a new value, namely the value that was returned from our function over here. 
Okay? So that's how functions operate whenever they uh, get variables or whenever they have variables, you basically copy the values into those variables. And then whenever a function is active, basically it has its own variables, namely the ones that are over here. You could also define in this cur between those curly braces in this block also new variables. And as we had before, whenever those variables then uh, they can help you over here, for instance, in calculating things. But whenever this block is ended or the function returns, the variables that you created over here, they lived in this blue block over here, but then are gone, right? So also this int b and int a, the parameters of that function, they're gone. All that we get back from the function is this one integer value, which happens to be 146. Okay? So that is how functions are called. Basically, you just write the function name, and then between the, the braces, you have then the values that you want to pass to that function. And that's it. <coughs> okay. Back to programming. We're going to see now another program that will kind of show you how functions can be called and how this is happening in a daily life of a programmer. So I have here, I'm starting here a little project that I will continue over the next um, 10 or so weeks that we still have left, where I'm going to work not in IO stream. IO stream is a bit boring, I think, because you have line by line some output and some input that you can get. But we can also draw and we can also draw in color. So that's what we're going to see now. And we are using the library and curses that we saw in the first week already quickly. We had this little example that shows you how to do things in N curses rather than IO stream. To make this a little bit more explicit, I'm going to show you this now um, in a programming example, right? And it will be a maze game, as you can see by the, by the, uh, by the description. Um, and the first example is a very, very short one, but we're going to expand on this by using more and more functions. All right, so back to programming, and I already have somewhere, there we go, May, zero, zero, uh, May zero 01. And in that case, I already have everything that you saw on the slides already here. Right. So this is already a little bit uh, squashed so that it would fit on one slide. But let's go first and see if we can read what is happening here. So we include a library called ncurses.h from the, um, the, the braces that you have here. Uh, you can see that it's a standard library. The .h means that it's actually a C library. This is just a small, a small thing. Uh, because ncurses is really, really old, but it's really stable and it's used by uh, many people. Over here we have our integer uh, that is returned by our main function, um, and which is also happening here at the end. All right, so that's something that we've seen already. Uh, we create here a couple of variables. We have a character called C, and we initialize it as the empty character, or a space, right? Um, this has, in fact, a number, as we know. It is, in fact, I think, 32 uh, for a space character, but that's basically what we have. One variable somewhere in memory called C and uh, holding a space. Then we have other, uh, two more characters, X and Y. I'm not sure why we have these as characters actually. Um, we could do this because those are numbers that are uh, coordinates on our screen. So either the line number or the column number on our screen tend to be not that big, so we could actually use a character <laughs> here. Um, well, let's do that, and later we can also switch to integer if we need to. Um, so that is those, those are three things that we define, and we have x and y set at 10. Then we have a couple of function calls. So this is basically something we can do only because we have n curses included here. If we wouldn't have done this, then our compiler would have said, I don't know what in its sc is. In fact, we don't know what this is. You would need to look at the documentation of the ncurses library to know that there is a function called init scur and that it is used to initialize the screen. Right? That is something that you need from a reference manual somewhere. You Google for ncur ncurses and you will see that these are, uh, that this is there. The same for curse underscore set. This is also a function. In fact, this function has one parameter, in this case, zero, 
Um, and this, again, you can read up on the internet or in the manual of n-curses. It's a function that will hide the cursor. So curse set zero means we don't show this blinking cursor in the terminal to see where you are. In this case, we hide this cursor so uh, you can't see this at all. Then we have a loop. We know loops by now. In this case, it's a while loop. And as long as C is not equal to the character Q, we keep on repeating whatever is in the block that follows. And what is uh, following there is that we use another function. Also, this one is called from n curses. It's called mv add k. This is a very hard uh, name to remember, but it means move an add character. It basically means it moves to the white column, to column Y in our screen, and to line X. Is it? No, it's the, the opposite way, I think. It's uh, line Y and column X, I believe, yes. And then t uh, write out or add to this <coughs> position the character at in this case. So note also that I put this already as uh, appropriate descriptions after each line. So this is basically funct a function that will draw an at character at line y and column x. Then we basically have another function, and this function is a very good prototype for a function that returns something. This function is called get for get character. It also is incorporated into n curses, and it basically is waiting for the user to press a key on the keyboard, and this key is then put into the character C. So in this case, if we press uh, an at or a question mark or an exclamation mark, those symbols will be put into C. And this is then a loop that will keep on going and going and going until the user over here put t presses the, the key Q. As soon as the Q is being pressed on the keyboard for quit, I hope you um, got that, we basically come up here and then C is equal to Q and then we leave our loop over here. Then we execute endwin, which is a function to end the window that ncurses has put on top of your terminal, and then return zero, right? So that is basically what is happening. It's a lot of explanation, but I think the functions, as soon as you know what they mean, or as soon as you read the description, you kind of see what happens, right? Let's see if I'm in the same directory. I'm not, so let's go to that directory. And then we're going to execute. Now, as we've seen in the first week, whenever we use this standard library ncurses, ncurses is not a standard C++ library. It's a library that is already installed in any Linux system that you will have, or any op uh, Mac uh, OS system, for instance, as well. But in this case, we need to also explicitly say that we're going to link while building our program, also the ncurses library with our program. And the way we do this is by saying uh, minus L for link, also a library, and the library is called ncurses. And then we can also say we need to execute, or we, we want our own executable called maze in this case, right? That worked. We have now an executable called maze, and we can execute this. Not ma uh, maze, there we go. So once we do this, our entire screen is emptied and we have our at over here at position 10, 10, right? And I can type loads of things now and you can see what I'm typing. And as soon as I press Q, it goes back to the way I was before, right? So what ncurses does, it kind of opens a window on our terminal where we can draw everywhere we'd like. Yes. Yeah, very good question, excellent. So yes, the question was, the ones that we have here, like in its screen, cursed, um, or move at character, or end win, those don't seem to return anything. I would say they could be void functions, but they don't necessarily need to be. It could be that these also return something. 
But in this case, we're never catching whatever value they return into a variable, and therefore whatever they return is lost. So it could be that they're void functions. If you want to know, you can actually look at the reference manual of n curses, and there you will see how those functions are defined. They could be void, but they could also not be void. They could also return a bool or so often, for instance, for end window or in its screen, it could be that you have a return value that says it worked, so like a Boolean, for instance, or an integer, like the way our main function always returns an integer. But we, just like the way our, uh, we have now executed maze and we never gotten the zero over here, um, it could also happen that we call a function but are not interested in what it returns. And it could be that any of those functions that we have there do return something, but they're not being used in our program. Right? So that's a very good question indeed. Yes, thank you. Okay. We're going to, app, uh, we're going to first, um, what shall we start with? Let's first start with a very simple function, because these two over here, oh no, let's do this later. First, we go for the first set, uh, the first assignment that we had in our slide, namely, we need to move our cursor or our player. This is going to be later our player in a maze. So let's do that. We have now our character C, and this C can then basically have any key press. That means if we pr uh, uh, press the arrow keys or the A, D, W, S keys, for, uh, left, right, up, down, we can basically move our character, right? So we can basically test what C now is, and then if it's any of those keys, we can then do something so that the next time we're going to draw in line 10 our at character, it will be somewhere else. That's the idea here, okay? How do we do that? If, we could do if, but this would be very, very long. It would mean, we would say then, for instance, if c equals our w function for going up, for instance, then we do this. Else, if it is the s, then we need to do that again. Or if it's a, or if it's d, then we, I mean, then we have to kind of have uh, four nested if else, if else, if else, if else. That's a lot. Exactly. Thank you very much. So basically, doing uh, this with a switch statement, which we've seen but not really used up until now, this would be a lot easier. Let me show you how fast and how easy it is if everything works, we'll see. So we switch on the variable and then check for the, num the, the multiple values that it could have. That is what the switch statement does. And then we basically say, if C equals the W character, then, and we do this with the case. So case W, then we do something. And this, what is following here is one statement or multiple statements that you can just add here one statement after the other. And those will be executed one after the other until somewhere in the switch statement, our program meets a break. And then it goes out of the switch, right? So basically it will be the, doing that for um, for going up, for going down, for going left, and for going right, right we need those cases. So the, the gamers among you will know, so W is going up, S is going down, A is going left, and D is going right, right? Now how do we go left, right, up, and down? Well, if we type W, we have to move our position so that now we go one line up. And the lines over here are the y variable, are get gotten in the y variable, right? That is the thing to know. So when we need to move a line up, what do we do with our y variable? Plus one or minus one? Minus one, but this is actually a good point. It could have been plus one, depending on where we start counting. But zero, zero is indeed at the top left in n curses. It could have been the other way around. Many drawing uh, libraries use 0, 0 at the, the bottom left, for instance, or sometimes in the middle of the screen, who knows? This is just something you would have to know from n curses. The same we do for advancing to the next line, right? So in that case, we do y plus plus. 
We could also do plus plus y, by the way. We've seen that too, right? In that case, we know that we have to increment it first, and then we um, go to the next, uh, the next part. We could also do that here, over here, but since everybody is always using y plus plus, I'll just do y plus plus here as well. The same for going left and going right. So the columns are represented by the x variable. So in that case, going to the left means going 1 to the left, which means indeed x minus minus. So the next time, x is getting the value 9, nine in that case. It was 10, the next time the value will be 9. Same for this one. In this case, we increase it when you go to the right. right? We should probably also explain this. Go up. Go down. Go left. And go right. There we go. And this is handling the moving. So basically, that we can kind of set. So depending on what the user presses, we change the variables, values, for x and y, and that way we can move our character and then draw the character at a new position. Otherwise, it will always be uh, placed at 10, 10. And then over there, you overwrite what is on 10, 10, right? So let's recompile first. Always recompile. Don't execute, because this executable needs to be completely recompiled. There we go. And then we execute our executable again. And there we have a 10, 10. And if we now move up or down, so let's move up, we can see I press W because what I'm pressing is, uh, is echoed at the terminal. And then if I press D for going to the right, you can see that the D is overwritten by our at character. If I go, go down by S, we can see that I'm going down. And if I'm going left, we can see that A is still written and that our um, at character is, is put that way, right? So this way I can move across the screen by just checking what the user has been pressing. Okay, and then when the user presses Q, so this is now our infinite loop that we're constantly in. We're now waiting here at our get character, at line 11. As soon as I press something, I'm pressing now H, which is something completely different, right? Nothing happens. If I press A, I go up. If I press W, I go down, etc. As soon as I press Q, I go out of our program, as before, right? So that is one thing. So that's just kind of a refresh of the switch statement, which I think is quite a nice um, introduction again, or a, a fresh up of what we've seen last time. Now, the only thing that we need to do now is actually um, make this a little bit nicer with colors. So let's add some colors. Now, first of all, you've seen that whenever I type a character, this is also outputted uh, to the window. This is not so nice. And because of that, we can also use a function from the end uh, cursor called no echo. Oh, sorry, you have a question? Um, where does the character with a W written in it and then up and down? Yeah. Not, not the no, this is exactly, this is a very good question. This is what I'm go now going to remedy. Um, so no echo means if I do no echo, then whenever I print uh, in the terminal, I'm not going to print it out. Otherwise, I will always print it out. It is very similar to the I.O. stream library. Whenever you do, whenever you use the C in, the console in object we'll see later, to ask the user, for instance, for a number, which you have done, right? So you basically put uh, C in into an integer. Then whenever you, the user needs to input something, you will see that the user writes something, and you can see this in the terminal, right? This is called echo. So whenever you're in the terminal typing something, it's always uh, put into the terminal, so you can see what you're typing. It makes sense. For our game, it does not make sense that we can see what we are typing, and therefore we're going to put use this function called no echo. That means we don't echo what the user has typed, we're going to just not show that at all, and then catch that in C, and then do something along the lines of moving around, for instance, or exiting our program. Yeah, but it's an excellent question too, of course. Right, so basically, no echo means uh, don't show uh, input. Um, how do you call that? Keys pressed, I would even say, instead of input. 
another thing I want to do is um, use color. And for using color, again, there, you can go to the link that is in the slides. It will show you how in any courses you can create color pairs, so-called color pairs. But first of all, when doing that, you need to tell NCurses to start using color in the new window. And that is a nice function because it's called start color. I mean, that is um, a very sensible function, I would say, right? So use color. So basically, as, as soon as we've done that, from now on, we have the availability of defining colors and using colors in our terminal. And then the next thing we need to do is define color pairs because in, we have a text terminal. And what, what is in a text terminal valid or what you can give a color is the text that you're typing, but also the background of the text. And that is called a color pair. And to do that, you basically need to uh, call another function called init pair, which is for a color pair. And the way to do that is a little bit convoluted. It's coming from an old age, um, Definitions where you start with the number one and you can do color pairs one, two, three, four, and so on. You first initialize them, so now we have one color pair that we're going to define first. And we do that with um, uh, constants that already are in N curses. Also, that is something that you can get from the manual. So, one of the color um, constants is, for instance, uh, later I want to do a background let's do this background first it will have the foreground blue so we do color blue and it will have the background green so we do color green so this is this is the first pair we want to do now what we when we do this um, we, we also want to later draw our character in another color pair so in that case we need to create another color pair called color pair 2 we just start with, with those color pairs like that. And there we can have another one. So I want, for instance, the foreground of my uh, character be blue. No, no, blue is already taken. Let's do red. And the background, I will do yellow. Those are all, co uh, all constants that you get from N curses. And also, like, there are some manuals that will show you how these are done. So now we have two types of color pairs that we can use. And when we want to, for instance, first um, initialize the screen and make it completely green with a blue text, we need to do this, or we also need to do this here. Right? So we want to give it some, some type of color. And the way to do that is another, uh, another function, which is called add on, which stands for at come to color attribute on. So we basically say here, um, set color to uh, pair to one. So in this case, we're going to use blue foreground, green background. And by do when we do when doing this, we basically say add on color uh, pair one. There we go. So from now on, whatever we are going to draw. We're going to draw with a blue foreground and a green background. <coughs> I know this is getting a little bit long, and also note that our main function is, is you know, barely spanning one screen. We're getting, we're getting there with long, long programs up until now. Now, there's multiple ways to do this for the entire screen, but what if I want to first create the entire screen and draw something on every character that we have on our screen? What do we do then? The only thing we know is that there is this function to type something at one particular location of the screen. But we need to do this for the entire screen, for all the lines and all the columns. In that case, we need a loop, right? Where we do this function that is now on line 16. We execute this function multiple times. In fact, a lot of times. So move add character, we're going to now draw on a particular line and on a particular column. So say line and col. Is it first line? Uh, yes. And we're going to give it, whoops, what happens? There we go. And what are we going to type? Well, we're going to type, for instance, a dot over here. 
And this needs to be done then for all the lines and all the columns. And this needs to be done for every line for all the columns, but the next line also for all the columns, and the next line also for all the columns. That means we need a loop, and I'm going to now use the for loop, um, where we go over first all the lines. For instance, line, we start at zero. Line is going until, and then we have lines as something that we also have to our availability. So when you have uh, n curses, lines means the number of lines that you have in the terminal, and then you do line plus plus, as we've already seen. So we start at line zero, then line one, then line two, until our line ends at lines, and then we stop. Now for every line, we're going to do that before every column. So we do a for loop within the body of the previous for loop. And there we go to do that for exactly the same, but for the columns. And exactly like that, you can do the same for, I hope this is right, calls or columns, I'm not sure. We'll see in a second where there is a, an error. And also that we do. So basically, we now repetitively do this for every character on the screen. We basically draw now a dot, and we have set this dot to a blue foreground and a green background. And now we want to set this back to the previous, so we can do adder of um, exactly the way we did it over here. So we unset this to color pair one. So now we don't use this color pair anymore, okay? I hope I didn't kind of baffle you too much, but we need color, really, it's really important. Now let's see if this worked. Um, so now we should, have see, we should see, or let's see if it compiles first. Maybe I used an error or not. So it is actually calls, as I saw before. Um, let's execute it. Voila, there we are. So now we have color. And now we can move in color. Our character is um, white on black. That is the standard color pair. And if we move in our um, game over here, we can see that we can are, are digging ourselves in a tunnel um, through our map over here until I press Q and then we go out of the game. The blue is the foreground. Um, so the dots are all blue. It's hard to see, I know, but I mean, we can also create, instead of a dot, we can create an O, for instance. That should be a bit bigger. We have to recompile to see that. And now look, we have O's. Those are blue, right? Uh, it's very hard to see, I know. But it's, it's exactly the same. So we can kind of keep on playing um, for this. The reason, uh, the reason why I said this is, or why I do this, is basically where our program is getting quite long. We've been using functions, and I know that this, you have to know how these functions work. Um, and you can ask ChatGPT or Google or a manual. It would not be different, basically. But up until here, we have kind of from line eight, to line 19, we would have to, we, this is something that we would have to do at the beginning of our program once, and that's it. The rest is basically our program itself. So our main function is now spanned over one screen and is almost becoming in, unreadable, right? And this is something we can use functions for as well. So now we're going to use exactly a function to kind of obfuscate this. And back to your earlier question, we could actually return something here. If something is going wrong, we can return something. But in this case, I think we're never going to return this. And instead of doing all these uh, functions, we're just calling this init for initialize or initialize. Initialize. That would also be a nice function, I think. Um, or init n curses. Maybe that is a nicer function. Right, so that is our function that is going to wrap up all these things over here. I just cut them, and I'm now going to paste them. And I'm calling it init and curses. And I'm starting the block. I will need to show the users or the people that are going to read this later what it uses. It's basically... Um, initialize um, 
all the functions to start drawing our the game. There we go. Initialize. Yes, you have a question. Um, printing uh, this function in the another file and calling it over here. Yes, and we're going to see that uh, very soon as well. So obviously, what we do here is we define our own function. It does not have any parameters and it does not return anything. This is called a very dumb procedure, basically. But the reason why this is nice to have is that our now our main function, the thing that we need to kind of look at to see how our game is going to develop in the next couple of weeks, is still quite short. It's not you know, the spaghetti code it was before. Um, we kind of put that away in one separate function. And we call that function init n curses where we can also just say what we want to say with that is basically initialize n-curses functionality, for instance. Functionality, there we go. So that way we basically know here loads of initialization is happening. We had to look this up once, but we don't care about this anymore. Everything else that is following here is now what we really want to deal with. Later we'll see that we can then also add some other things, some other elements to the game to make it a little bit more spectacular. Right? That is, that is the, the, the other thing that is quite interesting there. Another thing that we can do is, for instance, whenever we draw our character, we can activate our color pair like, like we had over here. So I'm just going to get this from here. So before and after we draw our character, we're going to say attribute on and attribute off, you know, color pair one, but color pair two. So we have a different color for our, uh, our own player. And also there, we could just add this to our own function. Actually, let's do that. Um, because this is also a typical procedure, how, you know, code is kind of growing. So here we don't have to give back anything to our function. We call our function draw, because later we might draw loads of things, not just our player, but walls or a lake or enemies, whatever. Um, and that's something we can then uh, use our function for. The only thing that our function will do is draw a character somewhere on the map. And for that, we need our integer x and integer y. Note I can use x and y here. These have nothing to do with x and y in the main function. This is basically a local x and y. Maybe I shouldn't call them x and y in that case. Well, anyway, I'll, I will like, call them x and y. Then you can see uh, through the example that we've seen in the slides that these are different x and y's because they are part of this draw function. Then the x and y's we have in our main function. Make sure that you understand why that is. What we draw is also something we can abstract. So we have a character called symbol. So in this case, we don't always uh, draw the at character, but we just call whatever value the, the character symbol has. And what we can also then say is an integer for our color pair. So with the CP, or actually that's the color pair, is another thing that we need to know. And in that case, we can abstract here two to color pair. So from now on, we can, do, we can use draw with loads of parameters where we just put in the values and then our draw function is switching to that color, drawing the character and switching back away from that color. And that is what is happening here. And to do that, in this case, when we are in our while loop over here, all we need to do is draw um, x, y in this case, which I think is a nicer way of, of showing this our at character and color pair two. Draw our player. Also, that is a lot nicer to look at, right? So that's the main reason why most people use functions. So that what we are reading here is a lot easier to kind of get. And all the, the nifty little functions that are very hard to understand from n curses are slowly going away here. We're just left with get character or get ch over here and end win over here, which are easier to understand, I think. 
but our main function is this way a lot shorter and a lot easier to read if someone is the, trying to read what we've done in our game so far. Right? Now let's see if I made a mistake. Did anyone see anything? Okay, it compiles. And if I start, I have now our character. And our character is leaving a trail. That's something we can also uh, solve next time. Um, but it's actually the using this color pair too, right? So foreground red and background yellow. And this way our, uh, our game is slowly taking shape. If I press the Q, we leave our game. Oops. Okay, any questions about this? The reason I wanted to show you this example is how functionalities from other libraries are just used, but how we can also define our own functions. This is a fairly simple function that just collects loads of functionality from n curses and abstracts this a little bit. This function here is basically for um, making sure that we can abstract the drawing functionality. So draw a symbol at position x, y um, with color, color pair, right? Yes, I will copy this into the slides immediately after uh, this. So you will see in the update of your slides that this, what I've pre-created now, is probably over the next two or three slides that will follow, okay? So you can try out these things for yourself. People in the past years have been creating loads of cool things with this, by the way. Um, I think Encurse is a little bit more creative than IO Stream, where you just look at input, output, input, output, line after line, okay? So that is just as an example, and uh, later we're going to see more and more things. So if you follow this, you will see another example that you could use, and so on and so on. Okay, just to show you how functions are used. Now, going back to the harder part is basically functions can call other functions, functions can call themselves. And functions can call themselves is also a bit weird, so that's what we're going to see in a little bit more detail. Now I'm sure that those of you who already had programming courses have seen recursive functions, but this will show it again on the level of memory, which I think is necessary in any programming course. And especially in C++, this has to be in the back of your mind at all times. What is happening in memory? And this is also giving the final uh, uh, answer to what we asked in the beginning. So if this function A is calling B, and function B is calling A again, and then function A is calling B again, and so on, we have this infinite loop. In the end, it will result in um, a stack overflow. But this really means that your memory is completely wasted, um, or full. And the reason why it's full is uh, because the recursive function, or this function that calls e these functions that call each other are slowly but surely filling up the memory with new instances of each function. And that is the new thing that you will see here in the next couple of slides. Whenever a function calls itself, you will have a new piece of memory being reserved. In this case, this is the typical example that you always will see in every introduction to programming course for a recursive function. It's a factorial. I'm Assuming that most of you will already know the factorial, so this is usually defined or noted as with an exclamation mark. So n is a number, and with the exclamation mark is basically saying this is the factorial of n. Right? It's a function. So basically if n is 12, then you want to calculate the factorial of 12. And the way you calculate that is the factorial of 12 is 1 if n is uh, 0, or it is n times n minus 1 factorial if n is bigger than 0. That means in the end what will happen here is for n is 12 is we go here, we do 12 times the factorial of 11, which is 11 times the factorial of 10, which is 10 times the factorial of 9, all the way until you get the factorial of 0. That is 1, right? So in the end, the factorial of 12 would be 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 8, 6 times 5 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 1. And that's the factorial. Do I have a, a, something wrong here? 
in the code parts. If n is 0, then I return 1. That's the first part over here. Else, oh, what is this here? If n is bigger than 0, well, uh, okay, I, I, I'm making sure that I don't have um, uh, the negative parts here. But else, then I return n times the factorial of n minus 1. Right? That is, that is correct. The factorial with the function name. Oh, the function name is wrong here. Why did I do that? Again, I'm going to live edit it. I'm sorry. But otherwise, I will probably forget. All right, screwing up my layout here. But anyway, good. Thank you very much. I mean, any of those, please tell me. So we define our function exactly along the mathematical definition, which is a recursive way. Note here that the function factor for the factorial is calling itself, right? And that means if we want to use that function, as we saw before, we basically can put the factorial of 3 in the value of that into a new double in this case, which we call f of a new variable. So that's how we would use the factorial for the factorial of 3, which in this case would be 6, as you can see here, right? So let's see in what happens in memory when we do exactly that. I'm sorry, I have again here the wrong uh, function call here. Just say this is a factor over here, right? So when we call that function, we, uh, we have our main function somewhere that we don't see. That is underneath uh, the visible part of our slide here. But somewhere in our memory, we reserve now space for our new instance of the factorial of 3, right? So we call that function. The function has only one parameter this time, which is called n. And this value 3 which is a constant over here, constant double, in fact. I should have put an F here for the float. Oh, I use a double here, sorry. Um, this is also another thing I need to fix because I had a float earlier, right? Anyway, so the value 3 is copied into our N over here, right? So when we do that, we go into our factorial function. Um, and what happens there is we come into this function. N is not 0 because N is 3. So I go straight into here and I return n times and now I call the function again. We're still in this factorial of 3, but now we're calling the factorial of 2. That means we need to add a piece of memory over here for our new factorial function, which is not the factorial function of 3, but the factorial function of 2, right? And there the same happens again. n is not 0. So we now reserve a piece of memory for the factorial function of 1, 2 minus 1, right? And I do this again, because now, only now, our factorial is 0. So basically, for doing this in the recursive way, mean, meaning the factorial is called in itself, we add a bit of memory, but we add on more memory, we add more memory, and we add more memory. If we would have had the factorial of 100, then you would have a hundred of these blocks filled in your memory. Now, of course, these blocks are not that big. They basically have just a couple of parameters and a return value. But if you do this endlessly, for instance, in the A calling B and the B calling A example, that means you would have these colored blocks slowly but very fast filling up your memory. And even if those things would just output something and would have just a couple of values, they would need some space in memory. And the space in memory would slowly fill up. And this would sometimes be very fast, according to how fast your processor is and how much memory you have, right? So the, the, for recursive functions, you basically build up, it's called a stack of in, in, in your memory. And then only when, and when you do this correctly, this stack is also built off, right? So now we're at 0. That means we return a 1. And now, this call is returning a value. So we do n times 1, which is 1. And now this function has been left, so we can delete it. This function has been left, so we can delete it. And this function has been left, so we can delete it. So really the yellow, the blue then, and the green functions are also removed. And memory is freed up again after you, you leave those functions. All right, so that is what is the important part with recursive functions. Memory is slowly filling up for each 
but each time you call a function within itself. So that's something that you would have to be aware of and that if something is going wrong, if you pro make a programming mistake and this ending condition is not there, then you will fill up the memory and typically what happens on uh, most systems is that you will get a core dump. The operating system says, oh, I don't have any more memory to, do, to deal with, so now I'm going to kill this process of yours, which is your program, and then you have a core dump. Right? So that is typically what happens then. That's what you will see in the exercises uh, very soon too. Right? So that is what I still wanted to show with recursive functions and where in fact we will stop with this class for today. All right? Are there any questions according to functions or according to what we do tomorrow? Everything clear? Right? So be there tomorrow. The first 45 minutes, so from 8.30 till 9.15, we will just have exercises as before. There you will still be able to ask us questions, but at 9.15 we will ask you to spread around here in the, in the, in the room, and then we'll give you a piece of paper where, in the typical exam style, you will have to write with pen, without any help, a, a, a piece of program or a code. Okay? All clear? Yeah, one question? Yes? So, yes, exactly. From 9.15 until 10 o'clock. It will be just one example, so I doubt that you would, have, you would need so much time. Because on the exam you have one hour and you have five or so of these examples. And this one is the simpler one even. Right? All I would say is try, try to continue this loop and if else uh, examples that we already post uh, plenty of and then that's how you're been perfectly prepared. Is that yes. Exam every two weeks? Exactly. So every two weeks we do this. We have basically an in class assignment where you don't have to do this the entire week long. You basically do it on paper in the class. We collect the papers and then you get afterwards the results from that. Results meaning we will scan your papers and we will show you where you went wrong, right? Yes. No, it will only be loops and the if-else condition. Because that is the first thing that really needs to sit. We hope that that is something you will completely uh, 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 understand. And of course, it implicitly also means that operators, assignments, variables, and types are also known. So for those of you who never programmed before, and this is the first, very, very first programming class, as I said, I hope that you've been you know, paying lots of attention to those as well because it's very important to know. You know types are also part of, of this exercise. But the, the core concepts will be about a loop and about if or if else conditions. All right? Good. Then thank you for your attention and we'll see each other tomorrow.